Amen. Well, good morning, family. How are we doing this morning? Let me tell you, you sound incredible this morning. And I'm excited to get into God's Word. You know, I did want to lift up a couple of individuals, and that was Esteban Flores and Min Kim as they just graduated from UC Berkeley. Incredible disciples that are absolutely sold out for God. You know, there once was a boy who stood with his back arched, head cocked back, and hands clenched defiantly. Go ahead, give it to me. The principal looked down at the young rebel. How many times have you been here? The child sneered rebelliously, apparently not enough. The principal gave the boy a strange look. And you have been punished each time, have you not? Yeah, I've been punished, if that's what you want to call it. He threw out his small chest. Go ahead, I can take whatever you dish out. I always have. And no thought of your punishment enters your head the next time you decide to break the rules, does it? Nope, I do whatever I want to do. Ain't nothing you people gonna do to stop me either. The principal looked over at the teacher who stood nearby. What did he do this time? Fighting. He took little Tommy and shoved his face into the sandbox. The principal turned to look at the boy. Why? What did Tommy do to you? Nothing. I didn't like the way he was looking at me. Just like I don't like the way you're looking at me. And if I thought I could do it, I'd shove your face into something. The teacher stiffened and started to rise, but a quick look from the principal stopped him. He contemplated the child for a moment and then quietly said, today, my young student, is the day you learn about grace. Grace? Isn't that what you old people do before you sit down to eat? I don't need none of your stinking grace. Oh, but you do. The principal studied the young man's face and whispered, oh, yes, you truly do. The boy continued to glare as, his, as the principal continued, grace. And his short definition is unmerited favor. You cannot earn it. It is a gift and is always freely given. It means that you will not be getting what you so richly deserve. The boy looked puzzled. You're not going to whoop me? You're just going to let me walk? The principal looked down at the unyielding child. Yes, I'm going to let you walk. The boy studied the face of the principal. No punishment at all? Even though I socked Tommy and shoved his face into a sandbox? Oh, There has to be a punishment. What you did was wrong, and there are always consequences to our actions. There will be punishment. Grace is not an excuse for doing wrong. I knew it, sneered the boy as he held out his hands. Let's get on with it. The principal nodded toward the teacher. Bring me the belt. The teacher presented the belt to the principal. He carefully folded it in two and then handed it back to the teacher. He looked at the child and said, I want you to count the blows. He slid out from behind his desk and walked over to stand directly in front of the young man. He gently reached out and folded the child's outstretched, expectant hands together and then turned to face the teacher with his own hands outstretched. One quiet word came forth from his mouth. Begin. The belt whipped down on the outstretched hands of the principal. Crack! The young man jumped 10 feet in the air. Shock registered across his face. One he whispered, crack, two, his voice raised an an octave, crack, three, he couldn't believe this, crack, four, big tears welled up in the eyes of the rebel, okay, stop, that's enough, stop, crack, came the belt down on the calloused hands of the principal, crack, the child flinched with each blow, tears beginning to stream down his face, crack, crack, no, please, the former rebel begged, stop, I did it, I'm the one who deserves it, stop, please, stop, Still the blows came back, crack, crack, one after another. Finally, it was over. The principal stood with sweat glistening across his forehead as beads trickling down his face. Slowly, he knelt. He studied the young man for a second and then his swollen hands reached out to cradle the face of the weeping child. Grace. The title of my lesson is, Grace Changes Everything. An incredible story that really gives us a true depiction of what God 
wants to extend to every individual in this room this morning. My first point for you is the saving power of grace. Turn your Bible over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's time to get into the Word of God, and it's time to get excited. So as I preach God's Word, I hope that the Scriptures of God impact your heart, but it so compels you that you just can't help but preach on back to me. Amen? Amen. In 1 Timothy 1, in verse 12, the Bible reads, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. you know, what an incredible passage of scripture. But it's Paul expressing his heart to his young understudy, Timothy. This book was written as Paul's last days were coming to a close. But he wanted Timothy to understand what has produced the life I have chosen to live? What has given me the, compel the compulsion to continue to persevere even though right now the chains that are holding me back from seeing you face to face? What keeps me going? I understand where I was. I get the fact that I, me, the man proclaiming the gospel of God's grace to all mankind, I was a persecutor, a violent man. I was a blasphemer. And I know what I deserved. I know what I should have got. I know what God in his wrath, if I would have persisted in my ignorance, what would have been dealt to me. But see, God snatched all that away. And in one moment we see in Acts 9, and as he recounts himself in Acts 22, the power of God's saving grace falls down on Paul, grips his heart, captivates his mind, and directly redirects his approach, not to where he's going and what he's going to do, but his entire life's purpose. You see, we understand from the book of Acts that Paul was actually trained under Gamaliel, who was a Pharisee. And if you don't know who the Pharisees are, they were the religious people. They were the religious leaders. You see, there was a couple, con there's a couple ways to respond to the times of that day. See, Judaism had taken its turn. And so there were a couple responses of how we were going to deal with the Hellenism that had come into our world. Yeah. You see, we have to understand, we, we, we hear the character of King Herod, but we don't understand King Herod was actually not a Jew. But because of the corrupt leadership of the Sadducees, who were supposed to be descendants of the high priest Zadok in the Davidic times, the Zadok or the Zadokines, as you say in Hebrew, but in Greek you say Sadducees. And so these people, the seven high priestly families were corruptly and in a very religious mafia style of way were taking over Israel. But they understood Rome was coming in that intertestament period. And so they, they knew that Rome had the power, but they had no money. And so they called upon King Herod, King Herod being the richest man, if history is right, to ever walk the face of the earth. See, King Herod, he oversaw the whole spice trade of the world. King Herod was not a Jew, but he was an Edomite, who the book of Obadiah is written to. And he 
the most powerful, richest man was called upon by the Israelites to come and lead Israel. The reason why is they said, hey, the Sadducees were like, hey, we'll make you a Jew if you marry one of our daughters. But it was not a point to honor God. It was to protect their own necks so that they would not be under the oppression of the Romans. And so here, the Pharisees are one of those responses in opposition to the Sadducees, though still lukewarm in their commitment. But they so focused on application. They so focused on knowing the text by word that Paul was one of the top Pharisees. He was the one that had, in a way, stayed committed more than all the other responses to this corrupt generation that they were now living in. He watched his religion, he watched his world all come to a crumble. He said, not me. I will actually take out the word of God. But in his zeal for God's word and keeping the script, he even, embell- he even co- like, agreed with the response of the zealots. And so he was the one committed Pharisee that was not going to allow this new sect that was in opposition to his culture, his religion, and his history overthrow Judaism completely. And so when the Sanhedrin had gathered together in the face of Peter and John, who was there when Gamaliel kicked them out? Paul was there as well. And so Paul committed to the scriptures. He said, you know what? I'm not just going to stand for this and tell them to stop talking. I'm going to murder them if they talk. And so Paul goes down in history as the one in Acts that was breathing out murderous threats, persecuting the church of God. So badly, it wasn't just a couple of Christians that, you, he, that he killed or that he wrote off for their death. It was thousands upon thousands upon thousands of disciples that he had set out to murder. Even so much so, when Stephen's clothes were mixed with blood, they dropped them at Saul's feet. And said, this is to honor Judaism. So we could protect our sex. So this man was no man that did not understand the power, the saving power of God's grace. He understood all that he could have answered for. God said, I will wipe it completely clean, and you have to worry no more. Where did Paul receive the saving grace? It was at the waters of baptism. But what's the power of grace? Well, he preaches about it here in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. In verse 8. It says. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works. So that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, Paul here, he's writing to the church in Ephesus. And this was a church comprised of both Jews and Gentiles pretty equally. So much so that the natural oppositions that they would have had, the racism that would have taken place in the first century, Paul was writing against to help them to be the light of the world, the example that would show that whether you're Jew or Gentile, slave or free, that we were all given the one spirit to drink and that under God's kingdom, we would be totally unified. But he begins by reminding them with a central focus. Remember what saved you. It was by the grace of God that you have been saved. And all of us who are sold out disciples understand the grace that has been administered to us. Amen. But here, as much in the first century that Paul would have been so excited to exclaim this from the rooftops. Sadly, 2,000 years later in modern Christendom, this is the most widely taken out of context scripture that we have. You see, we grew up going to, I grew up going to church where this was taught to me that not even reading the scripture correctly, 
that you're saved by grace alone, by faith alone. And that people teach in our generation that, hey, there's nothing I have to do because simply it is God's grace. And then I don't have to work as you extremists are trying to proclaim. You know, every time somebody reads this scripture and trying to refute or trying to protect themselves from just simply obeying God's word, every time they say, well, you say we have to get baptized. And that's a work. That's what man does. Let me, let me ask you a question. I just want to ask a logical question. What work are you performing? When somebody is lowering you down in the waters of baptism, what work are you performing? But they teach this not understanding the context of the scripture. You see, Paul was not writing to refute baptism. Baptism was not even an arguable thing within the first century. It was expected, but sadly in modern day Christendom, that the number one focal point for argument is the very point when sin, you receive the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven, you enter the light of God, and you enter God's kingdom. Sadly today, this scripture, even as we're sitting in these pews, there are churches that are telling people that you don't have to change. Not understanding that the works that Paul was actually referring to was helping the Jewish population within the church in Ephesus to understand that it was not by works of the law that you had to be saved. It was not by constant yearly sacrifice that your sins would be forgiven. See, what they were telling the Gentiles, being that they were from a very pagan background, they were telling them and teaching them that, hey, you got to become a Jew before you become a Christian. That's fine. You can become a Christian, but we're not going to let you into the church and be considered part of the light of God unless you become a Jew first. So you need to be circumcised if you're not circumcised. You need to be offering sacrifices if you're not offering sacrifices. You need to commit to all the religious holidays. You need to do everything we've done for thousands of years. You're not off that easy. And Paul was writing and saying, who do you think you are? What in God's name are you trying to create? They created a sect within the very church of God called the Judaizers. The group adamant about teaching this false teaching in the first century. See, so we got to get a good handle on our Bibles here because our world today is fighting to make it seem like what we're doing is outside of the grace of God. But we need to help people to understand the only reason why we are here, the only reason why we preach what we preach is because it is the grace of God that fuels our convictions. So he was refuting against the Judaizers, trying to help them to see the saving power of God's grace. But it also talks here and trying to help them to see in a sense that if they were to preach that and apply that and expect obedience to that, they would be calling people to earn their salvation. And Paul was saying, you didn't earn your salvation. In fact, everything you did was filthy rags to God. That it was not worth it. It didn't change you. It may have added a couple of meetings to your year or a couple of meetings to your week, but it never changed your heart. It was only the power of God's grace. Look over here at Romans 6. What was the other, the dichotomy of this? You had two major teachings that were fighting to, inter, to infiltrate the church. One was the Judaizers, and one was here in Romans 6. It says in verse 1, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead 
through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You see, here was Paul writing to the church in Rome. And the issue they were having, yes, they had the Judaizers there, but one group had sprouted its rear ugly head there, which was the Gnostics. The Gnostics were so evangelistic, trying to teach people that, hey, this is why he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue sinning so that grace may increase? What the teaching was, was that, hey, I, I, I have this incredible idea. This is awesome. Hot off the press. I got some good stuff for you. If I sin a lot then I receive God's grace a lot. That's good. I like that. And so their fight was to preach this very pleasure-driven way of life. So it accommodated to their sinful nature. And this is why Paul is emphasizing, he says, don't you know all of us who were baptized? So he assumes the whole church in Rome was baptized into Christ. You're with me right there. Yes. But he says here, because we were all baptized, you died to your old way of life. You no longer live to gratify the flesh. You actually have to turn from your old life. That now you should no longer live for yourself. But as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 13 to 16, that you should live for him who died for you. That when Jesus took on the weight of the world's sin, your name was on that line too. Your past, your present, and your future. God said, you know what? I'll take it. And it says he entered that tomb where he bled his blood. He shed it on the cross and into his burial. And it says he was raised to a new life. Paul then uses that and says the very illustration in which Christ the reality of him dying on the cross, being buried and resurrected, is why we now need to be baptized. He says the old life, your cross that you need to take up, you need to enter that watery tomb. Get your sins forgiven. It is not a work of man. It is the very work of God happening in that water. And that the life you live when you raise up is now a life full of the very spirit of God, the very grace of God. The other false teaching that has come out of this scripture is cheap grace. Well, I don't have to do anything else. Jesus paid for it on the cross. So I'm good. I'm good. You guys go do the extra work. That's extra credit. You guys go and live and, and try to build the church of God. But here's the thing. God done save me. I'm, I'm good. I'm locked in. Me and Jesus are like one, man. Like, you see, you know my relationship with God is good. And so this teaching has so infiltrated our world. Why? Because it calls you to do nothing. And so I want to challenge everybody who's studying the Bible right now. Because to some degree, you decided to come to church this morning and so there's a bit of religiosity still in your bones. And so we've got to reset those bones right there. That yes, there is no way for you to earn your salvation. But baptism is not something that you have earned. That is an institution given to us as a gift from God. But you can also not say that, hey, God did it all on the cross. He gave me a blank check and just said, write it for how much. You don't have to change a thing. There is no cheap grace in the very kingdom of God. But what is grace? How do we receive or how do we exemplify this saving grace? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look over at Titus 2. Titus 2, in verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches. Hold on, hold on, hold on a second. Grace is teaching now? 
Let's keep reading. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-control. Hold on, grace and self-control? You're telling me I'm not free? You're telling me I'm restricted? You're telling me that I know how to be controlled? (sighs) Don't ever say control in church in the same sentence. (sighs) But how many times have we been to a grocery store or been to some setting where there are many people and you've seen children absolutely out of control. Are you like, wow, I just can't wait to be a parent because that is what I'm looking for. I just love that that child is screaming on the floor, freaking out because they can't touch anything because mom said, you better not touch nothing, you better not look at nothing when we walk up in this store. I just can't wait to see this child out of control. No, as parents, we understand there is a deep conviction to be sitting in your right mind. To have what is called, oh, I'm about to say it, self-control. But see, it says the grace of God, it teaches us to be self-controlled. What is this scripture encompassing? That your old life is now no longer acceptable. But now you must deny yourself. You must, another word, repent. It's like Mufasa. Say it again, say it again. Repent. But you actually have to change. Paul understood this, and we look at him and say, well, I wasn't a murderer. I didn't commit adultery. Yes, but every sin is why Jesus had to die. Understanding that even if there was just a single inkling where you just told a little white lie, but you defiled your conscience, Jesus still needed to die for your sins. And so it's not about how great or how small. It is the very principle. You missed the mark of God. And so someone had to atone for that. And Jesus did. So when do I receive this grace? When you decide to turn from that old way of life, you repent and get baptized into Christ. Everyone who's studying the Bible, I want to challenge you. What are you waiting for? You understand that you are not proud of the things you are so ashamed of doing before. So it's time for you to make a decision to actually change your life because that's when you experience the saving power of grace. Amen. Amen. But this scripture is written to Christians. So there's a little bit something here for the disciples. You see, I find it that some disciples can come into the kingdom and they find that Yeah, I didn't earn my salvation. God's grace is why I'm here. But now I need to fight for my worth here in the kingdom. Because God's grace is only given to those who actually prove themselves. It says that you are not saved by works so that no man can boast. Some of us are trying to be perfectionist in the kingdom. And so you fail to be strong in the grace. You are therefore selling yourself short of actually experiencing the grace of God. Now, the other dichotomy is in Romans 6, where you feel, I don't have to do anything. I've done enough. I decided to, I said, Jesus is Lord. That's good enough. You better not ask me for nothing. The grace of God is in my life just like it's in yours. What makes you better than me? Because you do these things? No, 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 no. The grace of God should have an impact on your life to where it causes a decision in your heart to radically change your life. And so it's not okay for you to just fill up a pew. Your life should look starkly contrast to the way you used to live. So if there was some way you live, what does it say in Galatians 5? Any of you who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. God's saving power of grace should not be taken for granted. You know, there was once a man 
who had a large debt. He had credit cards, bought a house, did all these different things. But he realized, I don't have the money to pay for all this. I've lied, I've schemed, I've done impure things so I can get where I am at today. And so he hears of this ad where he says, a man is willing to pay off whatever debt. You know, you see those fake ads on the freeway where they're like, hey, if you are in debt, we'll help you. The reality is, is they're like, help me with a lot of money and I'll help you. Amen. <laughs> but here this ad was saying, whatever debt you have, I will absolutely pay for. And so the man desperate in his life says, you know what? I got to do something. There are people counting on me. And so he finds this man far and wide, searches, fights, and reads whatever he needs to read in order to find the right clues because it was a treasure hunt to find the guy. But he goes to him and says, tell me what your debt is. The man says, I've got a million dollars in credit card. I, I, I bought a house I can't pay for. The mortgage just hasn't been paid in a couple months. I'm about to get evicted. I bought a car. I bought this Bugatti. I regret that. I don't know why I did that. Um... My kids, are. Uh, I, I, I applied for loans I'm never going to be able to pay back. He says, write a check. Whatever it is you want to be paid will absolutely be paid. Everything was paid. He tells his friends. His friends come and they get their debts paid. It didn't matter how small or how great their debts were. God paid the debt. More friends came, and more friends came, and so much so that this man was called the financial savior of that city. And I find it is the same way for us. You know, I understand for myself that I look at myself the way Paul does. I understand who I was before I became a Christian. I understand that what I have and everything that I do is not what I deserve. God looked at me and didn't see any financial debt, though there's some still college loans on that one. But when God looked at me, he saw the spiritual debt. He saw the impurity, and he said, it's paid for. He saw the immorality. He said, you know what? That's paid for. He saw the pride and said, that's paid for. He saw the lust. He said, you know what? That's paid for. He saw my past. He saw all the darkness, the insecurity, the faithlessness in my heart. And he said, you know what? Don't worry anymore. It's all paid for. My second point. Don't insult the spirit of grace. Turn your Bible over to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, in verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and the raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two to three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is a very intense passage of scripture. And you'll find it as you study out the Bible. If you want to study out a very intense topic, grace is not a soft topic. 
It's a very intense and direct topic in God's word. And so here, the writer of Hebrews, scholars speculate who it was, and many of you have many ideas, but we're just going to say, because we do know for a fact, God wrote the book of Hebrews, amen? But here, the writer of Hebrews is writing to a community of Christians that had actually been faithful for a very long time. Many scholars believe that these were some of the early converts there in Acts chapter 2. And so fundamentally, this scripture here, this book was written in about 67 AD. And so what we understand from this is that this is right, being written to Christians that have been faithful for 34 years. And what was his plea to them? That they had forgotten. If you read all throughout the book of Hebrews, it's trying to convince them that Jesus is actually the high priest, just as Moses was the, the one to be, the one to bring the Israelites out of the end, to bring them into the old covenant. But Jesus is the one to establish a new covenant. And then he goes on to say, hey, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to clear to you because you no longer are trying to understand. He says, you need someone to teach you all over again. And so here we understand the magnitude of the writing. He's pleading with these disciples, come back. Please revert back to your first love as you have become dormant in your faith. He said, you've... You've forgotten the response you have when you were first converted. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And it was daily. So they didn't mind that church went a little long. They didn't mind that, hey, maybe things were going to get a little crazy. They said, you know what? If this is what it is, but my soul will be saved, then so be it. But here they had lost that faith. They had lost that willingness and so they insulted the spirit of grace. See, they have been saved for a while. But the Hebrew writer is fighting to help them see that you don't have to be saved much longer if you continue in the path you are continuing. What it's encompassing is targeting lukewarmness. He's saying you need to have that commitment again. So he reminds them. He says, don't you remember that you are able to enter the most holy place? What is it referring to? Well, it says in Matthew 27, in verse 45 to 52, how when Jesus died and cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that the tombs were broken open, that the rocks were split, holy people were rising from the dead. But it says the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Now, if you understand Judaism, you understand that they would only, the high priest could only go in there once a year to atone for all of the people's sin. And so when Jesus died, he became a wormhole. See, that tearing of the top to bottom, this curtain was not just an ordinary curtain like one of those. This curtain was four to six inches thick. Meaning that no man could move it, no man could tear it. Only God could. And so what was the thing that brought them into the presence of God? You see, the concept of Tearing robes is something traditionally through the Jewish culture. And so he's writing to Jewish Christians and he's trying to help them to understand things because when there was sorrow, there was a death, they would say, tear your robes. It was a sign of a torn heart. And so what was God trying to present to the people as his very son, the embodiment of his life, was dying on the cross? Is that not part of his heart was torn. His whole heart was torn in two, broken for the state of the world. And so he reminded them and he said, do you remember that Jesus is the wormhole that allows you not to enter one time a year? But every day you wake up to pray, you're not just praying in the vicinity in which you're standing. You are in the holy of holy places, in the very presence of God. And because of this, he says, let us hold unswervingly. It says then the Old Testament would have, if you would have held this passage or way of life of them entering the most holy places in contempt they said in that time under the law if you were to see somebody just not obey God's word two to three witnesses you'd be stoned on the spot 
And so he says, how much more if you trample on the holiness of the very covenant of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, how could you insult the spirit of grace? So it'd be like saying like, hey, Trey didn't have a quiet time. Christoph saw him, Bryce saw him, and was like, oh, Trey, you're not going to have a quiet time. I'm, I'm sorry, bro. I have to tell Moses. Here we go. And they would flat stone him. So Christoph would have to be the one to throw the first stone. And so he says, if that's how holy we held a covenant that was not even built on good promises, how much more the covenant of Christ, which is held on better promises? How much more? I can't help but think when considering insulting the spirit of grace, I can't help but think every time we do the cross study and we look at the crucifixion, you see Jesus when the Sanhedrin puts him on trial and Caiaphas is waiting in his house. And it says after, which the only thing Jesus died for, they tried to bring false witnesses and nobody could actually bring anything against him. And Jesus didn't even feel the need to respond because it wasn't worth his time. But the only thing that he responded to was they said, are you the Christ, the son of the living God? And he says, it is as you say. And so in the very real way, the only thing Jesus died for was the truth. But immediately after that, they called him a blasphemer and they spit in his face. Oftentimes I ask people, hey, you know, I have some, just a question. Um, you ever been spit on? You know what the most common answer is? Absolutely not. We, we hold it and look at it and it's repulsive to even think that that could be a possibility. Why? Because when you spit on somebody, it communicates you're not even worth the ground in which my feet walk. And the scriptures teach here that when we hold swervingly to the hope we once professed, it is like spitting on the face of Jesus Christ. Okay, well, what does it mean to hold or to not insult the spirit of grace? It's when we decide to willingly give in to sin, even though we're under the covenant of grace. As he's addressing directly here, he says, don't give up meeting together. When you just don't see meeting up with the disciples as the time to get with the family. You just see it as something you have to do so that nobody calls me and nobody asks me where I'm at. I just show up because I'm obligated. And you stop seeing through the lens that it is by the grace of God that you get to come to church. Do you realize that we get to be in the presence of God right now? That we get to be alive? That considering what we've done, that we don't deserve anything we've had? And so we get to do all that we do because it is by the grace of God. But when we decide that it is just not worth that much to us, what God has died for in having the church of God, we insult the spirit of grace. It goes on in verse 32, and it says here, remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in great contest in the face of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. See, here, the writer of Hebrews is trying to help them to see, do you remember where you were? Yeah. I want to challenge us as disciples, guys. We've got to constantly, day by day, reflect on the fact that God has pulled us out of darkness and brought us into the light. Because once you forget how bad it could have been in the world, you start to hold the kingdom, you start to hold your purpose, you start to hold the mission of God in contempt. You look at it as things you have to do instead of things you get to do. See, we have to understand that here he was talking to older Christians, and so humbly I want to come before those who have been disciples for longer than a decade. Because I, I believe this is not hard to slip into. Lukewarmness is actually natural. It's the natural progression. If you think about it all throughout time, 
People, instead of conforming to the presence of God, sought to do away with it. We don't want to conform to that. We want to do our own thing and live by our own desires. And I do believe that that can happen to any one of us. It says in Psalm 92 and verse 12, it says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. Does not remind you of Caleb's heart when he comes to the promised land for the second time and says, now after 40 years, I am 85 years old, but I'm more vigorous today than the day I came out of Egypt. There was no loss of heart, no loss of life. There was no loss of fight in that man's heart. Why? Because he understood that by God's spirit, that if I was committed and stayed persistent in the original decision I made when I said Jesus is Lord, that I would not stop, I would not falter, I would be kept from being ineffective and unproductive, but I would be perseverant and I would be fruitful. It uses the example of palm trees. Some may ask, why, why palm trees? I mean, I mean, it's tropical. Is it like relaxing when you, you, know, you live like this? Well, yeah. But there are palm trees in the tropics, but there are also, also palm trees in the desert. We most, we most often think that palm trees only produce coconuts. In fact, they produce dates or figs. And so this would have been a food of the Israelites. So they would have understood that the palm trees, they actually lasted 300 years. They could live a very long time. And it says that no matter the time, the time stamp on their life, it says they would always have green leaves. They would always be alive. They would always produce fruit. It wasn't just for the young palm trees. It was for all the people that would be the people of God. And so what was he playing here from this scripture? That you would make no excuse and not use your age spiritually or your age physically as a license for lukewarmness. This was the call and plea from the scriptures. And as your brother, as a son here in the church, I plea, you can't, I can't tell you how much I just love hearing the stories of the, those that are more mature in Christ. I love it because it inspires me. I'm like, one day, man, we got modern day Caleb's here in God's kingdom. You know how valuable you are. Your experience is so valuable, but your example makes it worth listening to. You know, I want to lift up an incredibly powerful, high-powered, spiritual woman of God, and that's Lynn in the Southland. You know, first meeting Lynn, uh, she was baptized in the crossroads. Crossroads Church of Christ. That was the days before the early, that was like, that was like when people were just getting started on this. And it was game, like, it was like work ethic was like, we've got to build something. They understood the situation that the world was in. And so they responsibilized themselves to truly change the world. And Lynn has persisted in that heart. She's been a disciple for over 40 years. Let's give it up for Lynn, amen. And here's the thing, she just placed membership from our former fellowship and has always been, per almost been personally, al already been personally fruitful two times. And here's the thing, she's going on her third, amen? But I want to challenge us to follow the example of our dear sister. That age is not an excuse. That it's an opportunity to shed light on things these young people you're reaching out to did not experience. But instead of making age or your maturity a barrier, you share your experience in cultivating a bridge for thousands upon thousands of souls to come into the kingdom of God. It's time to focus on the mission of God again. I want to challenge all of us. This is young and old. It gives you the range of, of old, but this is also to all of us here in this room. No matter how old or how young. 
The mission of God must be maintained at the forefront of your brain. And so if you have not been living out the mission, that is a direct correlation that you have insulted the spirit of grace. My third point. His grace cannot go without effect. Turn your Bible over to 1 Corinthians 15. Disciple, you will reignite the commitment you had at first. You will not have a license for lukewarmness, but that saving power of grace will be reignited in your heart, and it will be like a fire. And just as much as that fire will be in your heart, you will let it Take your whole body in flames and the whole world will come for miles to watch you burn. We can change the world if we make the decision to do so. You know, as I close out this lesson, I wrote a poem. It says, grace, it can change your heart. Grace is what God gives us. It's where he wants us to start. That though this life is full of sin, with his grace, we'll be with him in the end. With you in heaven, where we will sing about the grace of God, because truly the grace of God changes everything. And to God be all the glory.